Well, hello, everyone. My name is Tabula Savalidis. I'm the executive director of the Nassau County Medical Society and the Nassau Academy of Medicine. I want to welcome everyone to our webinar this evening. Um, in honor of Alcohol Awareness Month, we wanted to bring to all of you an informational session on alcoholism as a disease, addiction research, and recovery. Before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to inform everyone uh, that during the presentation, you'll be muted. Once we open the floor to questions, you can type them uh, either in the chat box or the Q&A box, and uh, we will uh, read them out to our speaker and he will answer them. This evening's speaker is Dr. Harshal Karani. Dr. Karani oversees Wellbridge's medical and clinical program, leveraging research to continually evolve new treatment approaches. He holds a teaching position as Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the Zucker School of Medicine. Prior to joining the Wellbridge team, Dr. Karani was a director of addiction services at Staten Island University Hospital and a leading member of the Opioid Management Steering Committee of North Will Health. Dr. Karani's intense dedication to the field of psychiatry and addiction is apparent through his educational and fellowship experience. He obtained his MD from the University of Texas Southwestern, where he also completed a residency in general psychiatry and a fellowship in brain imaging with emphasis on learning and memory and schizophrenia. He further specialized his patient care to expertise with a fellowship in addiction psychiatry at New York University. Without further delay, Dr. Rashad Karani. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to uh, participate in this lecture. Uh, the title of my lecture today is Alcohol for Enderfo, and it's really in uh, response to uh, Alcohol Awareness Month, uh, which is April of every year, and a number of public health efforts to raise awareness of potential challenges related to alcohol use in the general public, uh, but importantly, to raise awareness uh, among healthcare providers of a number of the actions that we can all be taking to help mitigate challenges related to alcohol and excessive alcohol use. Uh, so just briefly, uh, I appreciate the introduction and the invitation by the Nassau Medical Society. Uh, I uh, would like to just share a little bit of what I've been up to for the last two years. Uh, I'm presently the medical director of a addiction treatment and facility called Wellbridge, uh, really a remarkable project that's been in the works for almost a decade, uh, but we finally broke ground two years ago. Uh, we're located out in Calverton, Long Island, and um, certainly no one would have scripted doing this in a once a century pandemic, uh, but we have tried to remain resilient and push forward and really remain deeply committed to providing hope during these incredibly difficult times. You know, one of the central tenets of Wellbridge is that we aim to treat those struggling with addiction with dignity. And in order to do so, we firmly believe that addiction care must rely on science. As again, April is Alcohol Awareness Month, my lecture today really hopes to illuminate accurately the impact of alcohol on individuals as well as society as a whole uh, and strategies that we can all take to diminish negative consequences. Uh, and in particular, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and its subsequent aftermath, uh, an array of current metrics are suggesting that alcohol and drug behaviors are only intensifying, uh, certainly throughout Long Island, Nassau and Suffolk counties. Uh, so perhaps now more than ever uh, is a call to action. Uh, I have no disclosures to identify. Uh, and just briefly, the outline of my lecture today, uh, I'm going to focus uh, largely on the epidemiology of alcohol use, uh, as well as general strategies for recognizing alcohol use disorder in contrast to uh, problem drinking or excessive alcohol use, uh, and then briefly mention current treatment options uh, and if time permits, um, I will also touch on uh, some key areas of frontiers in alcohol research, uh, but I'm also happy to come back another day to take a much deeper dive on that section. I'd like to start though by taking a really brief aside uh, to highlight the cultural impact that a cultural compulsive phenomena can have and how that impact can unfold uh, in a very rapid time course. Uh, so here uh, we see uh, fairly recent epidemiologic data that have looked at uh, trends among 
uh, adolescents uh, in regards to depressive episodes. And since 2009, uh, there's really been a very alarming trend among young girls, 12 to 17, that have had increasing incidence of depressive episodes. When we look at this uh, same population of young females uh, here from 10 to 24, uh, we see kind of in conjunction with increasing depressive episodes, uh, uh, concurrent increase in non-fatal self-inflicted injury resulting in emergency department visits. Uh, so two really distressing mental health trends of parasuicidal behaviors and depressive episodes uh, in this unique group of young females. Uh, and, of, uh, and especially the, the note that something happened in 2009 that started to drive these changes. Uh, I, I must say that uh, I'm still adjusting to the virtual world of lecturing. I, I usually really like to interact with the, the audience and ask questions. Um, so uh, in somewhat the, the Socratic spirit, I will simply pose to you, what do you think happened uh, in 2009? Uh, so one theory, is that uh, in conjunction to the broad expansion of social media, uh, the Facebook like button was introduced in 2009. And according to Jonathan Haidt, who I have here in the insert, uh, who's a prominent social psychologist at NYU, uh, regarded by some as uh, one of the, the top 100 global thinkers of our day, uh, he's posited the thesis that the introduction of the cultural phenomenon of the like button really created a metric for popularity and in turn started to create changes in social hierarchies where young women were starting to engage in utilizing social media in a compulsive manner. Within that, I also want to name that this is a phenomenon that uh, has obviously been engaged in and taken up across a wide array of American life. But just simply the time scale here, that in 10 years, a little over 10 years, we're seeing dramatic changes in behavior and significant increases in key mental health indices. So let's shift gears for a moment now and take a look at this image. Uh, here again, too, uh, I would ask that you take a moment to kind of guess what this is. Uh, so what I'm depicting here is an ancient pottery jar known as a hu pot. Um, this is from the Neolithic village in the Henan province of China, known as the Jiahu village, which represents one of the uh, best preserved and oldest uh, early human communities. Uh, and the remarkable part of this story, though, is when uh, more sophisticated chemical analyses of uh, the composition of this um, ancient pot was undertaken, it revealed um, that there were mixed fermented beverages of rice, honey, fruit, um, going back almost to the seventh millennia before Christ. Um, so these findings were really direct evidence that ancient Chinese culture, some of the earliest known human civilizations, were demonstrating the ability to cultivate and process alcoholic products, uh, which in turn started to take on incredible social religious medicinal significance. Uh, and now contrasting that with the, the time scale of the like button, uh, this is now going back almost 10,000 years, uh, a thousand times longer than uh, the time frame that we've had social media. Uh, and here again, we see that human societies from around the world um, have engaged in varying degrees of complex, complex cultivation of um, fermented beverages, uh, and alcohol itself really became to be valued because of its analgesic, disinfectant, and obviously, really, obviously profound mind-altering effects. Uh, so in a very, very deep way, our relationship as human beings with alcohol um, goes back um, to our kind of earliest time of gathering into uh, organized communities, and it raises so many questions as to how alcohol may have directly impacted our anthropologic development, our social development, as well as, uh, in fact, our own biology. Uh, so uh, to fast forward a bit, a lot can happen in 10,000 years. Uh, 
and what are the, what's the kind of current state of affair of the impact of alcohol on modern life? So I now ask you to take for a moment to guess what this number is. Um, I'll give you a hint. It, it is not our uh, former president's tax returns. Um, so this number itself represents $250 billion. And in 2010, the estimated annual US societal impact of excessive alcohol use was approximated by this number, $250 billion, billion with, with a B. Uh, to put that in context, if we were to uh, view our kind of nation's tab here as its own independent country, this would represent the 45th largest GDP in the world, right in front of the uh, Czech Republic and right behind Pakistan. Uh, so this is an astronomical figure, and when we dissect you know, the components that represent it, uh, by far loss of workplace productivity represents the largest portion, uh, but very meaningful other components include healthcare, array of healthcare costs, uh, the health criminal justice system, uh, and uh, obviously motor vehicle crash. One of the most telling is that uh, approximately two million general hospital admissions each year are related in some form or other to alcohol use disorder, uh, which translates to upwards of one in four of every admissions to a U.S. hospital, either directly from alcohol uh, or some other sequelae. Uh, and here's one final number, 100,000, and this perhaps represents the most tragic cost. Each year, roughly 100,000 Americans die from excessive alcohol use or some complication thereof. I hope in just you know, starting to frame this lecture that we can all appreciate the staggering scale of emotional, physical, and economic impacts from excessive alcohol use. And really quite simply, these are trends that are just not compatible with a society that is intending for its citizens to have the best well being and quality of life as possible. Adding even more to this equation is again that looming stressors from the COVID 19 pandemic and the expectation that all of these indices will continue to worsen uh, if we're not. One of the most essential starting points, though, is especially for healthcare workers and healthcare providers, uh, is not only to value accurate knowledge but to, actually, to also value accurate language. Uh, perhaps more so than any other group, individuals struggling with substance use issues consistently experience stigmatization, alienation, and a very distorted experience of healthcare. And uh, for one, uh, there, there's a lot of culprits to blame, uh, and we'll certainly touch on some of the uh, key pieces uh, over the course of this lecture. Uh, some simple concepts, though, uh, I think are informed by the simple belief that we do not want to conceive of someone as solely a pathologic state. And terms such certainly like addict, user, junkie, or even alcoholic for that matter, uh, really take away the dignity of a human being by generalizing them to simply be a pathologic state. It would be equivalent to calling someone with a malignancy a cancer. Uh, and that I think would be hard for most to, uh, to, to appreciate or to ever uh, approach a patient with. Some alternative terms include person with a substance use disorder, person with alcohol use disorder, uh, or for that matter, uh, on the other side of the coin, a person in recovery. Uh, the other components here, we're gonna take um, a, a, a deeper look at in the subsequent slides. Focusing on uh, the role of words, uh, perhaps the single most important word that I should start by defining is the word addiction. Uh, and in many ways, this continues to remain elusive uh, and uh, contentious, depending on the audience and the groups involved. Uh, from the current the contemporary medical context, uh, the framework that's most often now put forth is addiction is a chronic relapsing disorder characterized by compulsive alcohol drug seeking, continued use despite harmful consequences, and long-lasting brain changes. Uh, simply to say, addiction is uh, 
a brain disease. Uh, but within that, I, I also do want to name that really critical perspectives from the domain of anthropology, sociology, uh, and social and criminal justice really highlight some of the limitations of this formulation alone. Uh, and I certainly acknowledge those limitations. I uh, will say that for the purposes of today's lecture, uh, really examining those facets are kind of beyond the scope uh, of what I think is the, the first step of appreciating the, the current medical framework. Uh, so with that, uh, for practical purposes, uh, I, I don't think you can have a, a self-respecting medical lecture without at least a few mnemonics. So here's the first mnemonic. Uh, this is the ABCDE framework put forth by the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And this is intended to just capture some of the overarching core features of addiction and substance use disorders broadly, which just to highlight a few is the inability to abstain from use, a loss of control over behavior, the emergence of craving for a substance. And that's a component that uh, really in the last five to 10 years has uh, been given a lot more added significance. Uh, and then lastly, decreased ability to recognize interpersonal issues uh, as well as problematic emotional responses. Uh, so in many ways, a, a very complex syndrome that encompasses biological, physiological facets, as well as psychological and social ones. And in some ways, the fact that it's such a broad kind of operational definition uh, when it comes to public policy or even when it comes to medical practices, uh, there are challenges or dissonances uh, in being able to manage all aspects of addiction as a disease. Uh, so I wanna actually try to simplify this all um, for a better kind of more functional understanding. Uh, and in some ways, this is the framework that is often applied in research today uh, and can give you a much more critical perspective when looking at research literature in addiction. So from the five broad components I'm highlighting, there are really two key constructs to appreciate, one of consumption and two of consequences. For the most part, uh, research studies that are evaluating uh, either pharmacologic measures, behavioral measures, social interventions, uh, will be either examining the impact on consumption or consequences or both. But there's something else here between the ABCD framework uh, as well as this one uh, that I really want to call out. And that is that in both addiction care as well as psychiatry as a whole, we are moving more and more towards appreciating diseases as spectrum disorders. Uh, and in many ways, I think nature is really defined by a multitude of spectrums and perhaps really the hallmark of human existence uh, and what makes all of us unique uh, and special uh, in, in this world. Uh, but again, I think modern medicine struggles in being able to calibrate responses that can be personalized, that can allow for really unique management of care. Uh, and there's many domains of medicine that are trying to find effective solutions for this. Uh, I am depicting here uh, a specific genetic phenomena called pleiotropy, where a small cassette of genes um, here depicted by two species of flowers can actually demonstrate a very wide array of phenotypes. Uh, here, you're looking really at less than a dozen genes that are impacting the uh, flower color and the morphology of the leaves, and you're seeing uh, such an array of diversity. When we now kind of apply the same kind of idea to a disease process as complex as addiction, where at a minimum hundreds of genes, if not potentially thousands, can be influential, uh, you really arrive at essentially an infinite array of diversity in the way that an addictive process can present, uh, and the interface with that process with uh, individuals' environment, uh, as well as their early developmental experiences. So setting the stage again from addiction as a spectrum disorder, uh, some key concepts to appreciate really are from this hierarchy. Uh, alcohol use 
um, can really be broken down into like, four broad domains. Uh, abstinence, represented by no alcohol use, to low risk alcohol use, uh, and then really the key terms I wanna focus on of risky use, as well as uh, once someone crosses certain key thresholds of framing uh, alcohol use disorders, where there's really a disruption in biological, social, and psychological functioning. So here again, kind of clarifying some of these terms, which I think are very often uh, liberally used in, in clinical or everyday speak, uh, but sometimes uh, the import of them is a little misunderstood. Uh, so first is drinking in moderation, contrasting that with problem drinking, which can go by many names. Uh, and in, especially when looking at research literature, uh, it's important to keep in mind how they've defined problem drinking or how they're using terms such as excessive drinking or binge drinking. And then finally, uh, really the clinical domain of alcohol use disorder, which is stratified into three tiers. Uh, so before we can really examine what these definitions are, uh, the first key concept to appreciate is what constitutes a standard drink. And this again is uh, basing the framework of these definitions on consumption. Uh, and so a standard drink uh, is usually depicted in a graphic like this, a 12 ounce regular beer uh, or a five ounce uh, glass of table wine. Now I will say uh, many times when I present this framework to patients, uh, those struggling with alcohol use disorder or uh, even in general practice, uh, they're often really surprised that their expectation of what constitutes a drink um, either far exceeds this uh, or their expectations around what constitutes drinking in moderation uh, or healthy levels of drinking um, is all, also often overestimates um, what current guidelines suggest. Uh, to that end, I'll say there, there's a a very nice piece recently in the New York Times uh, looking at a series of women that shared uh, some of their narratives uh, around adjusting to many of the challenges of the pandemic. Uh, and in particular, a uh, really widespread observation of marked increases in routine alcohol consumption. Uh, some really kind of putting forth the idea that it had become their ritual to have a bottle of wine uh, or even two uh, as a nightcap after a busy day of Zoom calls and meetings uh, and tending to any number of family needs. Um, so I'll uh, just put this to all the clinicians to quickly ask yourself, well, how many drinks are in a bottle of wine? Um, so the, the, the correct answer is not one. Um, so a standard bottle of wine has 750 milliliters, which translates to five drinks if not a little more. Uh, so if, again, this is becoming more and more a ritual practice, as you'll see, uh, one bottle of wine already represents a heavy use pattern for both men and women. So what do I mean by heavy use pattern? So heavy alcohol use is a, a very precisely clinically defined term. In men, it represents four or more drinks per day, uh, or over the course of the week, more than 14 drinks. Uh, whereas in women, that's three or more drinks per day or a total weekly consumption of seven drinks. Uh, in contrast, drinking in moderation, uh, and here again, I think for many of these cutoffs will probably seem um, uh, quite conservative, but the current guidelines suggest two or less drinks per day for men and one or less for women. Uh, so uh, where does this all kind of come together now? When we look at binge drinking, uh, that's again, kind of applying the framework of the heavy alcohol use definition. Uh, that's represented as for, uh, for men as five or more on any occasion. Uh, sometimes you'll see it defined as within two hours, but I think functionally within a day. Uh, and for women, uh, four or more drinks. Uh, and here we see really quite stunning uh, epidemiologic trends. About one in six folks in uh, adults in the US engages in binge drinking. And now applying this framework to the $250 billion number I presented earlier, the vast majority of that cost 
is incurred by binge drinking, upwards of 77%. And I think that's an important, really important issue for healthcare providers to appreciate. Uh, while it may be uh, that you're encountering the alcohol disorder in extremists in, in the ER, in your day-to-day -day practice, uh, which can obviously be incredibly demanding for uh, the patient, their life, uh, your practice, uh, it's really this widespread uh, binge pattern and uh, excessive alcohol use patterns uh, that are driving much healthier patterns of consumption. Uh, so a bit of an aside, uh, one common uh, uh, quip that I have heard over the years is, yeah, yeah, I, I hear you about excessive alcohol use, but alcohol is good for my heart, right? Uh, so I want to take a moment to just examine where this idea has come from. Uh, going back to uh, the early 80s, there was a really landmark paper that was published in Lancet uh, by a British group uh, that put forth the idea of the U-shaped curve, alternatively it's called the J-shaped curve, uh, demonstrating the relationship between alcohol and mortality. Uh, the study itself uh, looked at 1,400 British civil servants over a 10-year period and controlled it for smoking, other health risk factors, uh, and ultimately arrived at this J-shaped curve observation. Uh, the simple interpretation of this curve is if you drink a little, you're less likely to die than if you don't drink at all. And if you drink a lot, you're more likely to die than either of the other two groups. Uh, so this study, as it turns out, is one of the most widely cited addiction uh, medicine works, I think upwards of like 800 citations. Uh, and a number of attempts to reproduce this effect, examining different groups, different age groups, different areas of the world. Uh, and in some ways it has been reproducible. Uh, and in, uh, to just highlight this further, uh, if we look at never drinkers, folks that have abstained throughout their entire life, uh, as compared to folks that are drinking two or one, depending on the gender, uh, le uh, or less drinks a day, we see that individuals that have low levels of drinking tend to have uh, a decrease in all-cause mortality over any given period of time. Whereas if you now start to approach uh, the threshold of heavy drinking, uh, four or three drinks respectively by gender, you see a marked increase in mortality and that raises in a kind of dose responsive relationship as folks drink more and more. Uh, and so in many ways, this is what informs uh, the cutoffs of the, the definitions that I presented to you earlier. Uh, what are some of the underlying mechanisms at play here? So the Decrease in cardiovascular risk associated with drinking in moderation um, seems to be in part due to increases in HDL cholesterol, as well as suppression of insulin resistance uh, and uh, the attenuation of an array of coagulability factors uh, and de decreasing the likelihood of certain key cardiovascular events, um, such as strokes, MIs, or pulmonary emboli. Uh, in contrast, the elevated risk of excessive drinking is associated with increases in blood pressure, uh, triglyceridemia, as well as a strong association with smoking. So with excessive drinking, you kind of uh, incur the triumvirate of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and smoking, which are all very well identified risk factors for uh, cardiovascular events. But there's another, I think, important part of the story related to excessive drinking patterns. Uh, and these, I think, represent um, some of the most concerning ongoing public health risks. Uh, the first is fetal alcohol syndrome. So fetal alcohol syndrome still occurs in approximately one out of every 100 US births and represents the leading cause of preventable intellectual disabilities as well as birth defects. The second uh, domain is early onset dementia. Uh, and I think that 
for so many healthcare providers, this is now going to be one of the biggest challenges as uh, we're uh, kind of bracing for what's been described as the silver tsunami, the kind of graying of the American public. Uh, some really staggering statistics in that front where by 2025, uh, we expect to have uh, more than double the number of Americans over 65 uh, than we did in the year 2000. Uh, within that, um, if we look at some of the uh, higher ends of the curve, uh, the US today, uh, in fact, has more octogenarians uh, than all of India, a country that has uh, a population more than four times that, that of the US. Um, so the challenges that are represented by the, the shift towards uh, a more geriatric US population are going to be realized on many fronts. Uh, but the role of excessive drinking uh, is, I think, one that uh, doesn't perhaps get as much attention. Uh, there are clear associations that excessive drinking represents, again, the most preventable cause of all-cause dementia, but especially early onset dementia, um, which is defined as features of dementia before 65, uh, or in some cases, even before 60. Uh, and I must say, uh, I am certain many of you have uh, been impacted by or are being impacted by uh, the, the really unforgiving nature of dementia in your own family life, if this is something that as a community of healthcare providers, we can take a much more active role in preventing, uh, it will have really uh, an estimable benefit on society. Uh, and lastly, I'll just mention that cancer um, also has a very strong association with uh, excessive alcohol use. Um, upwards of all, uh, about 5% of all cancers and cancer deaths uh, are directly linked to excessive alcohol use, ranging from uh, conditions such as oropharyngeal cancers to hepatic processes uh, and, hip and liver cancer. Okay, um, shifting gears again, uh, captured by this idea uh, that I've heard countless patients share to me that it's not that I have a drinking problem, it's just that everybody that cares about me has a problem with my drinking. Uh, and now kind of naming the fact that alcohol use disorder in some ways really has a lot more to do with the consequences of alcohol use as opposed to consumption itself. Uh, and here again, focusing now on the top part of this hierarchy, uh, when we look at alcohol use disorder, approximately 6% of all US adults would meet criteria for alcohol use disorder. Uh, and that represents about 15 million people. Uh, I imagine many of you have seen this uh, simple chart. Uh, it's a nice comparison between uh, DSM-4 and DSM-5 and kind of how we've uh, arrived at some of the newer frameworks of uh, conceptualizing alcohol use disorder. Uh, I will uh, simply highlight that again, the, Within the definition, there's no specific rate of consumption or numeric, and depending on the number that are present, you can then uh, stratify the severity as mild, moderate, or severe. Uh, uh, somewhat helpful mnemonic to put all this together is uh, AUD, the definition is composition of the presence of withdrawal or tolerance and or tolerance, as well as the five C's of AUD, which uh, is a bit more of a kind of refined take on the A, B, C, D, E framework. And that's a loss of control around alcohol use, the presence of cravings for alcohol, uh, disruption in uh, one's health and relationships, uh, compulsion to drink, and ultimately an inability to cut back. So some combination or permutation of all of these features is how we arrive at the diagnosis of AUD. And here again, we're naming that upwards of 15 million adults in our country currently struggle or meet criteria for AUD in some form, a very, very widespread issue. Uh, this brings me to uh, perhaps one of the most alarming ongoing trends uh, in uh, American healthcare. Uh, despite the really widespread role of alcohol use and alcohol use disorder 
the vast, vast majority of individuals that struggle with these issues never access any form of formal care. Among adults, that figure is generally approximated as one out of 10. Uh, and when we look at adolescents, that figure falls as low as one out of 20. Uh, to me, I, I, I think we would be really hard pressed to find any other disease process or condition in medicine where nine out of 10 people afflicted with that condition never access any care for it. Uh, we have so, so much work to do on this front. And I think really defining and finding more effective ways to engage patients in treatment and effective strategies for their care um, is, is all of our responsibility. Um, so with that, I wanna kind of offer now a bit more of a summary slide. Uh, and I uh, wanted to highlight uh, the, the quite sad news, uh, uh, the loss of one of the most significant figures in uh, American addiction medicine over the last uh, 50 years. Um, so uh, Dr. Mary Jan Creek was uh, as some, uh, is often credited as the founder of methadone maintenance in the US. Uh, she was a really uh, seminal uh, researcher at uh, Rockefeller Institute uh, who uh, sadly passed away uh, late uh, last month. Uh, her work highlighted uh, a number of the key strategies that uh, using pharmacotherapy can play in managing complex substance use issues, primarily focusing on opioid use disorder. Uh, but uh, the top portion of the slide, I think, really captures uh, some of her key ideas that uh, the concepts I've presented to you so far really focus on this domain of primary prevention, this triangle on its side, uh, where a number of social educational strategies can be incredibly impactful in shaping behaviors and minimizing the progression to later phases that ultimately culminate in addiction. Uh, here, uh, from the kind of initial onset, the transition that uh, often is encountered is to sporadic intermittent use, then to regular use, and then ultimately some harassing the threshold where they're then starting to meet the criteria for a use disorder. Uh, there are a number of strategies that continue to be explored, uh, but presently we have a number of pharmacotherapies uh, that can be very useful. Uh, and in some ways, the earlier these issues are detected, the earlier that medications are considered, uh, the, the expectation is that the prognosis uh, will be a lot better. Uh, and uh, to highlight the consequences of not considering these options, uh, at the top portion of the slide here, you see that uh, in the absence of pharmacotherapy, uh, relapse rates are just astounding. Uh, when it comes to opiate use disorder, in the 12 months following uh, an individual being in treatment, uh, without any form of pharmacotherapy, relapse rates uh, kind of approximated as high as 90. In some studies, you'll see as high as 98%. Uh, and for cocaine and alcohol, um, while not quite as intense as opiates, um, again, in the range of 60 uh, to 65% uh, rates of reinitiation of use without pharmacotherapy. Uh, so, uh, I think before uh, we can really get to making decisions around pharmacotherapy, it's important that we all are at least exploring systematic ways to introduce screening in our practices. Uh, with that, I think the most common response I get from physicians is, well, I just don't have enough time. Uh, and my response to that is, as it turns out, there are some incredibly efficient ways to screen as simple as single item screening questions when it comes to problematic use, a validated uh, single item question is simply to ask your patients, how many times in the past year have you had four or more drinks in a day for women, five or more for men? Uh, and if the answer is greater than zero, then that screen's positive and should invite a more systematic approach or a more comprehensive approach uh, to look at other issues that may be going on. Uh, I wanna be mindful of the time here, uh, so I just want to name uh, one tool that uh, can be quite useful, the Audit C Plus, uh, which I think is especially timely given recent legislation uh, legalizing recreational marijuana in New York. Uh, 
I think there's not enough dialogue yet as to what the impact uh, that should have or will have uh, on healthcare practices, uh, especially in regards to screening and referring folks to treatment. Um, so the audit C plus actually has in conjunction with the three core questions around alcohol use, an additional question around marijuana or cannabis use, as well as uh, illegal or prescription drug misuse. Uh, I uh, am you know, quite, quite certain it is not in any form a widespread practice to ask patients routinely about cannabis use. And it's, I think, going to be something uh, of a pressing need in the, the years ahead uh, as access to cannabis is starting to change. Uh, within that, and I'm not going to go through every element here, uh, based on the scoring of the Audit C, you can arrive at some really straightforward decision-making processes, either to facilitate further counseling, further uh, uh, social supports, or start to move someone towards uh, more specialized treatment options. Uh, but again, in many ways, these processes can never, never happen if you're not taking the time to introduce some kind of systematic process to screen all your patients. Last few comments here, and uh, uh, I will certainly wind down for today. Uh, when it comes to treatment, uh, addiction care can look like a lot of different things. And simply put, effective and comprehensive addiction treatment really encompasses this entire schematic. Uh, and I think that's, again, partly where uh, we encounter challenges in how people conceptualize what's effective and what care uh, should be, as opposed to say, uh, prescribing uh, antibiotic for a pneumonia, uh, prescribing this entire continuum of processes um, entails a lot of services, entails a lot of effort uh, for patients and providers alike. Uh, within this though, the two domains I just very briefly want to call out are that of pharmacotherapy and of self-help groups. In regards to pharmacotherapy, my simple comment would be we have a lot of effective treatment options for helping individuals with alcohol use disorders. Um, there's still a lot of misunderstanding around these agents and they still remain widely underutilized. The three top ones represent the current FDA approved options for AUD. That includes disulfiram, acamprosate, and naltrexone. But the rest of these can be used and uh, there are many conscientious ways to use them properly and effectively uh, and uh, certainly domains that I, I invite all of you to explore further uh, and, and start to incorporate in your practices. Uh, the final piece of treatment I also want to call out is the role of 12-step. 12-step uh, simply represents one of the, if not the most effective and widespread tool that we have today. Uh, I uh, anecdotally will share with you that one of the requirements I've had for residents or trainees that uh, rotate with me uh, is that they have to go and attend an open meeting uh, and experience what a 12-step process is like, um, for, especially for those that never have before. And uh, I intentionally go out of my way not to give them any guidance as to how to access or find an AA meeting uh, in, in, with the intent of simulating uh, what many patients encounter, that AA will be kind of presented as this perfunctory thing uh, or uh, kind of a handout is given to a patient to say, oh yeah, here, call this number and here are the resources. Uh, where uh, residents, uh, you know, high, pretty high functioning professionals really encounter a lot of frustration going about the process that way. Uh, so that in itself has been illuminating. On the flip side, the other really illuminating facet is once they actually attend a meeting, they really find it to be a transformative experience in appreciating the social cohesion, the bonding, the array of dynamics that can unfold in a 12-step process. And once they're able to visualize it, they're much more better suited to actually facilitate connecting patients to uh, this really, really invaluable tool. Um, so in closing, um, I will leave on this note of saying, uh, we still have a really long way to go. Uh, 
this was a, a landmark survey that had been done some time ago, uh, but many of the trends have been repeated uh, in more contemporary studies. Uh, so simply put here, 90% of primary care physicians fail to diagnose uh, alcohol or drug use disorders, especially when early symptoms are being reported. Uh, around uh, less than 30% of primary care providers actively screen for substance use issues. Uh, and lastly, less than 20% of primary care providers consider themselves confident or really prepared to deal with these issues. Uh, our responses to these situations, I think, are complex and varied. Uh, I've been very, very pleased to see uh, at the Zucker School of Medicine uh, a real commitment to transform medical student education, moving away from the kind of national average of uh, most trained physicians only receiving two hours of any instruction over the course of their medical school and residency um, to uh, now at Hofstra, uh, there's over 50 hours in medical school alone. Uh, and I'm really hoping that as we start to make more and more commitment um, towards transforming how healthcare providers view addiction, we'll really start to see uh, uh, the, the, the who pot as half full uh, instead of half empty. Uh, so I will stop there and I really appreciate everyone's time. Okay, uh, so we're gonna open it up to questions. So whoever has any questions, you can type it in the QA box um, or um, the chat box and we'll, we'll ask the questions. Alexa, do you wanna take over? All right, questions? it looks like we already have one question from Robert Klein. He asked, how do you view marijuana in, in the addiction spectrum? Uh, great question, and I think especially timely uh, in, again, the context of uh, some of the ongoing changes in legislation throughout the country, uh, and with Newark especially, uh, as of April 1st now, legalizing recreational marijuana. Um, I think there's a lot of parallels between uh, the kind of relationship I imagine will evolve in the U.S. with marijuana uh, as we have with alcohol, that uh, we will need to be able to define uh, what represents moderate or healthy levels of marijuana use. Uh, and we've struggled to do so, uh, in large part because of the legal status uh, of marijuana. It has been very hard to systematically study, uh, and it's created a real barrier. Uh, and even if we look uh, comparatively in international studies or uh, different countries where uh, marijuana has been uh, much more permissively available, uh, the, the systematic approach of defining what constitutes healthy levels of use um, has been uh, challenging. So I, I would hope to see that we move towards a more systematic framework. Uh, the other element uh, would, so that would be again on the kind of consumption side. On the consequence side, uh, the narrative around uh, marijuana or cannabis exposure uh, being associated with intensification of an array of mental health issues, particularly psychotic disorders, uh, is one that I think really needs to be given more attention. Uh, not to evoke the, uh, the, the, the old lore of reefer madness, and I think a lot of the, the uh, misrepresented harms of marijuana, uh, there really clearly seems to be an association with high dose or high potency cannabis exposure, especially prior to puberty, being associated with uh, increased risk of certain psychotic illnesses later in life. Uh, and there have been a number of recent studies uh, looking at population-wide effects of the availability of high potency marijuana and the increasing incidence of psychotic illnesses. Um, so. Uh, again, as far as public health potential threats go, uh, this is one that we really have uh, to start to make a concerted effort to understand uh, and prevent. Uh, I uh, understand uh, Governor Cuomo's framework was to earmark 20% of all tax revenue from cannabis sales to prevention and research. Uh, I'm uh, you know, very eager to see what, what that actually looks like and the types of efforts and uh, projects that can emerge to, to help answer this, this really important question. Thank you. Christian Kletta says, thank you for taking the time, Dr. Green.
you have any advice for medical students on the call tonight? Things to look for in patients seen on rotations, ways to discuss AUD slash OUD with attendings. Oh, wow. Some, someone after my own heart here. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the, the simple first uh, guidance uh, for um, any medical student that's getting interested in addiction care uh, is to start conversations with your patients around their substance use. Um, those, uh, unfortunately, uh, can feel uh, like awkward or uncomfortable conversations, uh, but when you start to make a commitment to open that dialogue, uh, you will naturally start to uh, gain more of a confidence and comfort with it. But with that, I will add, there are some really well-established strategies as to how to navigate these conversations. Uh, the framework that is perhaps most widely used is what's called motivational interviewing. Uh, it's largely derived from the framework of uh, positive psychology or Rogerian psychology uh, that highlights that change is often the, the natural reaction to situations. So individuals struggling with substance use disorders naturally want to change towards healthier, more positive behaviors. Uh, and as uh, their care provider, as uh, the, the supportive medical student involved in, in their care, uh, if you can start to allow that change process to unfold, uh, it can be incredibly powerful. Uh, and with that, I'll add, uh, there's a number of studies that have highlighted the transformative power of brief interventions. That change process doesn't have to take 10 years of individual therapy, uh, that even in one conversation or two uh, in an acute care setting or while someone's being uh, cared for in a, uh, you know, a med surge bed, uh, you can really start to uh, catalyze uh, that change process for a patient. Absolutely, thank you. Do we have any other questions? No, it does not look like we have any other questions from the audience right now. So I'd just like to say thank you, Dr. Grain, for taking the time to be with us tonight and for presenting on such an important topic. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you.